This morning, we are embarking on our study through the book of 2 Peter. This year, I've elected to forego a Christmas series. We will have a Christmas message um, on Christmas Eve, as well as December 20th, which will be our Christmas service. But until then, we're just going to be marching through the book of 2 Peter. Now that we've concluded 1 Peter, I decided just to pick it up here. I'd like to begin this morning by giving you a little introduction, and then we will deal with the salutation, which is verses 1 and 2 of 2 Peter chapter 1. A brief introduction. First Peter dealt with the enemies that we face outside the church. Namely, the persecution that comes to us from an unbelieving world. And Peter gave us a lot of insight into how we are to live as aliens and strangers in this world. We're just passing through. This world is not our home. First Peter dealt with enemies from without, and second Peter deals with enemies from within the church, namely false teachers. Paul told the elders in Ephesus to be on guard for themselves and all the flock, Because false teachers will come in from among you, Paul said in Acts chapter 20. Jude says, from within your own ranks men will arise teaching heresy. Peter is dealing in this epistle, just these three brief chapters, it's probably going to take us six months to get through. Peter, in these three brief chapters, deals with the issue of false teachers, He's going to help us identify the false teachers that existed in the church at the time of the writing of this letter and also find application on how to recognize false teachers today. Did you know that there's two New Testament books that deal with the issue of false teaching? That is 2 Peter and the book of Jude. And elders are exhorted over and over and over and over to identify false teachers. In fact, in the New Testament, many false teachers are named explicitly. Their names are given and written down for everyone to see. Faithful shepherds not only feed the people of God, they not only tend to the people of God, but they protect the people of God. It is the duty of every true shepherd to call out, to expose false teachers, to clarify what is false in their doctrine and expose them for who they are. God cares about us. He cares about the way that we live. He cares about what we believe. He cares about what we think. And so he has given us shepherds who are faithful to protect us from damning lies. Now as we go through this letter, you'll note that Peter does not explicitly say or identify who the false teachers were as it relates to a particular group of people. Many scholars, in fact, most modern scholars today, believe that the Gnostics, or an early form of Gnosticism, is who Peter was going after. Gnosticism comes from a Greek word, gnosko, and it means knowledge. Gnostics believe that they had a secret knowledge that nobody else had. And uh, some commentators believe that's the false teachers that Peter's dealing with here because of the prominent use of the word to know or knowledge that you'll see rises out of this epistle. Although Peter does not explicitly name who the false teachers are, I'm not totally convinced that it's Gnostics, Peter does tell us many things about these false teachers. Let's do a quick survey of these three chapters on what these false teachers do and what they look like before we jump into the salutation. First of all, notice chapter one, verse 16. Peter tells us that these false teachers follow cleverly devised tales. They don't uh, talk about the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but cleverly devised tales. He also says in chapter 2 verse 1 that false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies and denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. 
But notice he says, they will arise from among you. And just stop right there for a moment. Did you know that in every true church, false teachers arise? It's a difficult thing to identify them and it requires discernment sometimes. Myself and the elders, in fact, have believed that we've identified several that have arisen arisen among us and they have left. And I think that you might be able to identify some of them if you knew them as we work our way through this book and Peter explicitly tells us what false teachers look like, what their motivations are and some of the things that they say. You and I need to be discerning. Today, people attend evangelical churches. In fact, 30% of the world's population is said to be Christian, still the largest religion in the world. And yet, false teaching and false teachers abound. Just because someone says that they're a pastor, just because someone says that they're a shepherd, just because a building calls themselves a church or a gathering of people calls themselves a church, it doesn't necessarily make it so. We need to recognize and understand that false teachers will arise among us introducing secretly destructive heresies. How do we know who they are? How do we know what their teaching is? Or how, if their teaching is destructive rather? Well, the best way to recognize false teaching and false teachers is to spend your time in the truth. My wife works for a bank and she touches money all day long. She's had a couple classes on how to recognize counterfeit bills, but the best way to recognize counterfeit money is by touching the real thing all the time. And because she touches the real thing all the time, as soon as she touches a counterfeit bill, she instantly recognizes it as fake. You don't need to have an apologetics class to recognize heresy. You don't need to be an excellent student of the cults to recognize heresy. You just need to be intimately acquainted with the real thing, with the truth. But Peter tells us several things about these people. One of the primary ways to recognize a false teacher. Now, a false teacher is someone who claims to speak for God. They'll say, hey, I'm a pastor. But as you examine their life, you'll be able to see and detect immorality in their life. Anyone who says, I'm a teacher from God and lives an immoral life is a false teacher. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2 too. Many will follow their sensuality. Because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. They love sensuality. Turn to the book of Jude real quick, just a couple books over, right before the book of Revelation. If you get to the book of Revelation, you're at the end of the Bible. Just go a book before that, the book of Jude. Look at Jude, verse four. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons, listen to this, who turned the grace of God into licentiousness. False teachers say things like this. I'm not really concerned with following the rules. I'm concerned with being loving. I'm not really concerned with morality. I'm just concerned with love. Mark those people. Because false teachers, they creep in unnoticed under the guise of being a Christian, and as they get in among us, they promote sensuality and licentiousness. Licentiousness is where we get our word antinomianism. Noma is the Greek word for law. Antinomianism means anti-law. They deny the Christian's call to obey the Ten Commandments. Now, we can't perfectly obey the Ten Commandments, But Paul says crystal clear in Romans chapter six that when the spirit indwells us, the spirit of God does work to conform us to the law. And we are sanctified and become increasingly less sinful as we walk with God. False teachers don't promote holy living, they promote licentiousness. Listen, someone says, I teach for God, and they're promoting no boundaries because of grace, They're a false teacher. Peter goes on in verse 13 of chapter two. 
Suffering wrong is the wages of doing wrong. They count it as a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes reviling, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's a way to recognize false teachers is someone who follows uh, the ways of Balaam, and we'll get into what that is when we get to that passage. But for now, it's important to note that Peter is just hammering the reality of their immorality. Look at verse 19, promising them freedom from uh, while they themselves are slaves to corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. They promise freedom. They say, hey, uh, the gospel means you can live however you want. And then they themselves are enslaved to sin. They also want material gain. Notice verse three of chapter two. And their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Beware of pastors that are making huge amounts of money from the ministry without giving it to the Lord. Mark those men. Elders are not to be lovers of money. Now there's a lot we could say about that. It's not a sin to be wealthy. But you can identify pastors that love money. I'm restraining my lips right now. I had more to say about that. We'll come back to that issue when we get there. They also reject authority. They're an authority to themselves. Notice verse 10 of chapter two. And especially those who indulge in the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Particularly, the group of false teachers that Peter's talking about in this epistle are those that denied the second coming of Christ and the reality of judgment. Now, it's important to understand that false teachers that promote licentiousness do so by ignoring or denying the reality of judgment. If you're going to a church where you don't have the pastor preaching about judgment, flee from that church. You cannot understand the gospel without judgment. God is holy. He is righteous. And we deserve judgment for our sin. Now the grace and love and mercy of God is that he sent his son to absorb the sin that you and I deserve. But in order to understand the true gospel, the biblical gospel, you have to embrace the reality of judgment. Notice 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 4. And this is what they say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the father fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Verse five, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the, that the, word, of, uh, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. False teachers don't talk about judgment. Today, you're probably not going to find a false teacher that creeps in unnoticed to the evangelical church that just outright says there's no such thing at the second coming of Christ. But what they'll do is rather than focusing on the judgment at the second coming of Christ, which is what's going to happen when Jesus comes back, they focus on, well, it's just gonna be roses and butterflies. They won't deny the second coming of Christ, but they'll deny the reality of judgment. The epistle of 2 Peter is all about identifying, exposing, and fleeing from false teachers. By the time we're done with these three chapters, we're going to be better equipped than we have before we begun in dealing with those who would seek to distort the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for this morning, we're just going to take the first two verses, the salutation. Would you follow along as I read? 
Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Lord, as we now embark upon the exposition of these two verses, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would give us illumination, that you would help us better understand who we are in Christ, and we pray that you would work in those who may be among us that don't yet know you, that you would grant them saving faith, and that we that do know you would be humbled and thankful more than when we came into this room for the salvation that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Peter begins this book the same way he began 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, he begins by identifying himself, the author, and the audience or the recipients. Turn back to 1 Peter with me just so you can see This structure, notice in verse 1 of 1 Peter, chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's the author, now to the recipients, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. Now, that's modern-day Turkey. It seems that Peter is writing to those same believers. It's the same audience. Turn back to 2 Peter, chapter 1. So Peter identifies himself in verse 1 as Simon Peter, A bondservant, or doulos is the Greek word, slave, a slave of Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, a slave of Jesus Christ and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now the word Peter is omitted in some early manuscripts, but it's rightly included here, identifying Simon as Peter because Simon was an extremely common name in the first century Israel, so there were many Peters. But this is Simon Peter, God, or his, his birth name was Simon, Christ changed his name to Peter, and he identifies himself as the very Apostle Peter. Now, we're going to brush over that for the sake of the sermon, but I think here it's important to note that um, many scholars today deny the existence uh, or deny the reality that Peter wrote this epistle. We're not going to really tackle that in this sermon series, but a good commentary if you're interested on the authorship of 2 Peter would be by uh, the New American Commentary and the 2 Peter edition by Thomas Schreiner. So if you're interested in that, let me know. You're probably not, but let me know. But the title of my message this morning is True Faith. True Faith. In 1 Peter, Peter identifies the recipients of his letter as aliens and strangers. And the reason he identifies them as aliens and strangers in that letter is because he was foreshadowing what topic he was going to deal with. And that is the reality of being a stranger on this earth and feeling the persecution as a result of it. We're aliens and strangers. We're just passing through. Here in this epistle... Notice how he identifies the recipients. He identifies the recipients as those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Now why does he say that? Well, because what he's saying is, is I'm writing to you who have the same faith that I do to expose those among you who don't have the same faith. Everyone look at me. Do you understand that there is a such thing as false faith? And churches are filled with people that think that they're saved and their faith is false. They have been deceived by false teachers. And so Peter does not call this same group of people aliens and strangers here. He calls them those that have the same faith as ours. To say it another way, those who have true faith. That's the title of my message this morning, True Faith. I have four points for you. I'm hoping to get through them. I confess it's probably not gonna happen, so we may just pick it up next week and we'll get as far as we can. Point number one for you note takers, write this down. We're talking about true faith this morning. I want you to note, first, 
the obtainment of true faith. This is our first and longest point, the obtainment of true faith. First, again, note the word faith in verse one. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Do you see that word faith? Mm -hmm. This word faith, pistis is the Greek word. It's used in three ways, three primary ways in the New Testament. Number one, it's used to refer to our confidence or trust in Christ or belief. I have faith, I have trust in Christ. Like in 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes, same word, that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the saving, the Savior. Second, it refers, this word refers often to an intellectual knowledge of God or to the doctrine of the church, true Christian doctrine. In Jude 3, Jude says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to your appearing that you contend earnestly for the faith. Actually, I want you to see something. Turn to Jude. Turn back to Jude real quick, just so you can get your eyes on this. This will make sense if you see it. Jude verse 3 Jude writes, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. Do you see that phrase, the faith? Everybody see that? The definite article, the, attached to this same word that Peter uses identifies the faith as a body of doctrine. That's why Jude can go on and say it's handed down to the saints. It's the body of doctrine that's been handed down to you and me. Go back to 2 Peter. Notice in 2 Peter, verse one, when Peter says to those who have received a faith, you see a faith versus the faith, the faith, the definite article the is omitted. He's not talking about a body of doctrine, but he's rather talking about our confidence that we have. It's not an objective faith he's speaking about, it's subjective. This word faith is also used to describe our individual spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12, verse three, where Paul says that to each of us is allotted a measure of faith. So there's number one, subjective, which is our confidence in Christ. Number two, objective, our intellectual knowledge, a body of doctrine. This is how the word faith is used or an individual spiritual gift. Here, Peter is referring to our subjective faith. The faith that we exercise by trusting in Christ. The context makes this clear. To those who received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Those who have faith in Christ. But what I want you to notice more is the word receive. Look at verse one. Do you see the word to those who have received? Everybody see that? Okay, now we're gonna do a little Bible study here. We're going to unpack this word and hopefully um, tell you something that you probably never knew you wanted to know. The verb received comes from the Greek verb lankano. It means to obtain something as a portion, to receive or to obtain. Notice that Peter is saying that saving faith the faith that you place your trust in Christ, uh, that faith, is received. Now this word, lankano, originally meant to obtain something by lot. To obtain something by lot. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew people believed so strongly in the sovereign providence of God that he brought about every result in their life, including even the smallest result result of the casting of lots. This word, lankano, it literally means to receive something as a result of a lot being cast. To say it another way, to receive something by the roll of the dice. They believed that God was in control of everything, even how the dice fell. 
Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 18.18 says, the cast lot puts an end to strife and decides between the mighty ones. But why did, in biblical times, the Hebrew people believe that casting lots was in God's control? Well, the answer to that is because God, on several occasions, commanded them to cast lots with the implication that he was controlling how the lots fell. Are you with me? By the way, this is going to be important in a minute because if you're a Bible student, you're recognizing that in four places in the New Testament, there were decisions made by the casting of lots. I'm going to show you two of those in just a moment. But the one that most people ask questions about is who? Acts chapter 1, when they had to choose a replacement apostle for Judas, they cast lots and they chose Matthias because of how the lots fell. And some people read that passage and they're like, wait a minute, they chose the 12th or the 11th apostle, Paul was the 12th, or the 12th apostle, Paul was the 13th, they chose the 12th apostle by a roll of the dice? Yes. This is gonna help you understand a little bit more why. Ready for do a little Bible study with me? I trust it'll be worth your time. Turn to Leviticus chapter 16. I just want you to get your eyes on the, this passage so you can understand. Peter has all this in his mind as he chooses to use the word lancano to refer to the faith that we received. Hang with me, I promise we'll come full circle and this will hopefully make an impact, all right? Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, notice verse 8. Genesis, Exodus, <coughs> Numbers, or Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right. Leviticus 16, 8. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now this is for the Day of Atonement. Remember there were two goats presented at the Day of Atonement, and one goat, they would lay hands on it, the high priest would lay hands on it, and that goat would represent receiving the sins of the people, representing expiation, removing their sin from them. And that goat would run and run and run and run, representing their sin being taken out of the camp. The other goat would be sacrificed, uh, representing propitiation, right? But when they got these two goats, how did they decide which one would die and which one would be the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement? The answer was God commanded them to cast lots. A roll of the dice. So wherever the dice fell, it was God's will. And it was God. If you read the context of that, this is God commanding them to cast lots. Secondly, another way that it's used, turn to Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. You remember God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, or the 12 tribes are named for whose sons? Anybody remember? Jacob's sons. Jacob had 12 sons. Remember, Jacob goes with his 12 sons into Egypt when there's a famine in the land and they end up staying there for about 400 years. They grow and become slaves to the nation of Egypt. Uh, God then raises up one of them, one of the Hebrews, Moses, to be second in command in Egypt. Speaks to Moses and says, go send my, set my people free. We all know the story, right? The Exodus. They go to the Sinai Peninsula. They wander around for 40 years. Even though it was only an 11-day journey, they wander around for 40 years because of their disobedience. When they get into the promised land, that's the nation of Israel, they, they cross the river Jordan. What book is that? The book of Joshua. And as they go into the promised land, there's 12 tribes named by the 12 sons of Jacob. And as they get into the promised land, how do they decide where they're going to live? God said, by the casting of lots. Look at Numbers 33, verse 54. Numbers 33, verse 54. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your family. Not like a lot like we have with our homes today but you shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger you shall give more inheritance and to the smaller you shall give less. Wherever the lot falls to anyone, that shall be his. If you go back a couple verses and read the context, this is the Lord giving instruction to Moses on how this should work. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. 
God's instruction to cast lots on these major decisions then leads the Hebrew people to incorporate lot casting into making other decisions. In Judges 20 verse nine, we read, but now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah and we will go up against it by lot. They even waged a war by the rolling of dice. I know what you're thinking. Wow, I hope our government leaders aren't doing that. But again, you have to understand the thinking. They believed something that we struggle to believe. And that was this, listen. Every single thing. Let me say this again. Every single thing that happens in your life and in mine happens because of the sovereign, providential hand of God. Everything God is in sovereign control of. So when the Jewish people got to a place in their lives, they're like, I don't know what to do. They're like, well, let's cast lots because God knows what to do. And we're not deists, meaning we believe there's a God and he's removed. We're theists. That's what Christians are. We believe there is a God and he's involved in every single minute detail in our lives because that's the picture that the God of the Bible paints or is painted to us. That's who he is. He's involved in every detail. And in fact, they cast lots for many more things. You'll remember in the book of Jonah, when God tells Jonah to go preach to the people of Nineveh, Jonah doesn't want to do it. And what does he do? He runs from God. And he gets on a boat and he decides to sail in the opposite direction from Nineveh. And as he's sailing in the opposite direction from Nineveh, Jonah gets on a boat and what happens? God sends a big storm that comes on the sea and the people, the captain and all the boat people get together and they're like, whose fault is it that this storm came on? And what do they do? They cast lots to figure out whose fault it was. And guess who the lot falls on? Jonah. So what they do, they threw him over and that's when the whale swallowed him. Jonah chapter one, verse seven says, each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so we may learn or learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Why did Jonah get swallowed by a whale? Because it was God's will. How did they know that they should throw Jonah overboard? Because they cast lots. Not only that, Jonathan broke Saul's oath in 1 Samuel 14 and they found out that it was Jonathan through the casting of lots. In the New Testament, casting of lots is referred to four times. Let's look at those. First, turn to Luke chapter one. Are you getting a little understanding of this idea of casting of lots? You're like, yeah, Ryan, I, uh, I never knew I wanted to know about this. I'm not sure I do. Just kidding. Luke chapter one, notice verse nine. Luke chapter one, verse nine, we read, actually back up to verse eight, now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in that uh, appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord, Lord to burn incense. This is a reference to Zechariah. Remember who Zechariah was? John the Baptist's father. John the Baptist's father, he was of the uh, tribe of Levi and he was a priest. It was a great honor to be able to get to offer a burnt sac or a, a, an offering of incense to the Lord in the holy place. But to be a priest that was selected to do that, it was by the casting of lots. Zechariah, the lot was cast, it fell to Zechariah and Zechariah goes in to offer incense. This is where he meets the angel Gabriel and Gabriel tells Zechariah that he will become the father in his old age of John the Baptist. Notice uh, verse 11. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. 
you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine nor liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, that is Christ, and the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn their hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know this will be for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you good news. How did God decide uh, or broker a conversation between Gabriel and Zechariah? Through the casting of lots. Through the casting of lots. We also see this again in Acts chapter one. Turn to Acts chapter one. I mentioned this earlier. This is the selecting of Matthias. You remember Judas died. He hung himself. He was the uh, betrayer. He betrayed Christ, but not by accident. It wasn't as if Christ did not know. He selected him for that purpose, scripture tells us. And then when we get to the book of Acts, Beginning in verse 21 of chapter one, we read, therefore it is necessary that the men who have accompanied us all, the time that the Lord went in and out from among us, so this new apostle had to be with them. This tells us that there was more than 12 people always with them as Jesus was teaching them. Beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up, uh, was taken from us, one of these must become a witness with us as his, to, as, um, of his resurrection. Verse 23, so they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord who know the hearts of all men, show us which one of these you have chosen to occupy the ministry of apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them and the lot fell to Matthias and he was added to the 11 apostles. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So now, when you come across this idea of casting of lots, I remember when I was a, a, a new believer, I heard a pastor say to me one time, well, it might have been a mistake that Matthias became the 12th apostle. And that, made, that was like, oh yeah, that makes sense because it's like stupid to cast lots. <laughs> That's not the case biblically. Remember, this idea of casting lots is rooted in a strong belief in the providence and sovereignty of God. Now, I'm not advocating that you go cast lots to make decisions in your life, but I am advocating that everything that is in your life, you see it as from the hand of God. Now, it is important to understand that they did not believe that the casting of lots was a random outcome but that God was in sovereign control of all outcomes. Turn back to 2 Peter. With that in mind, with all of that in mind, I want you to go back to 2 Peter and look at that word again, received with me. To those who have received of faith. When lots are cast, remember this word literally means to receive by the casting of lots. When a lot is cast, do you have anything to do with the outcome? How do you get the power to believe in Christ? Answer, you have absolutely nothing to do with it. You receive faith. You don't work faith up in yourself. Oh, the grace of God on your life. If you're here this morning and you've placed your faith in Christ, it's not because you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's because God in his mercy and his grace gave you faith, not by any doing of yourself. Just like you can't control the outcome of a cast lot, you have no control over the faith that you have received. It was granted to you. It was a gift. 
Now we need to go into the theology of this. Are you with me? Okay, we're probably not getting done with uh, uh, more than point one, so we're gonna come back. You ready for this? We need to do this. This is gonna be helpful. Everybody got their theology minds on? The idea of this word received is that you and I do not have the faith to believe in Christ within ourselves until God first provides us with that faith. The faith that we have, listen to this, has been given to us. It's not, listen, people get tripped up here, and this is so freeing if you'll get this concept. They're like, well, what if I stop believing in Christ? Can I lose my salvation? You're not gonna stop believing in Christ because the faith you have isn't even your faith. It was something you received. Your faith was given you and you did not earn it, you did not have it and because you did not earn it and you did not have it and it did not come from you, you cannot get rid of it. Don't worry, relax. This should put you at peace. You were given a faith that you did not have. Now theologians call this, everybody tracking with me so far? Here we go, we're going in theological deep end. Stay with me. Theologians call this, write this down, you're gonna need to write some notes here to track with me because we're gonna, we're gonna go after this a little bit. Theologians call this prevenient grace. Write that down, prevenient grace. The word prevenient comes from a Latin word that means to come before or to go before. So before I exercise faith in Christ, that faith has to be, what? Provided to me. But we need to be careful here with the word prevenient grace. If all you just heard was the word prevenient grace and you don't stay with me for the next 10 minutes, you're in danger of teaching or thinking error, all right? Track with me here. Every arm of Christendom believes in prevenient grace. At least they say that they do but there are several definitions of prevenient grace. So you need to have the right definition of prevenient grace. So God provides you with the faith that you need to respond to Christ. There are three different understandings of prevenient grace. First of all, Roman Catholics teach prevenient grace, but they do not mean what we mean. According to the Council of Nicaea, the Roman Catholic view is what they call assisting grace that aids people who choose to cooperate with it. So the idea is that you have the power to respond to God, but God assists you to respond to him by giving you provenient grace. Does that make sense? That's how Roman Catholic theology defines provenient grace. Within evangelicalism or Protestantism, there are two main ways of thinking about provenient grace. One is an Arminian view, and one is a Calvinistic view or a Reformed view. So let me tell you what the Arminian view of provenient grace is, then I'll tell you what the Calvinistic view of provenient grace is. The Arminian view is that at the cross, well, let's back up. Arminians, shaped by Jacob Arminianus, they taught and still teach today, Wesleyan Arminianism teaches this and all different branches of Arminianism teach a form of this. Hang with me now. They teach that when Jesus died, he did not die to save anyone. Meaning his death was not effectual. It didn't have an effect. What they teach is that when Jesus died, he took away the aspect of total depravity that um, keeps our wills in bondage to sin. So the idea is that Jesus came, and when Jesus came to die upon the cross, he restored humanity back to the state that humanity was in before the fall in the Garden of Eden. Does that make sense? So when, it talk, when we talk about, everyone listen to me, when we talk about the free will of man, 
we're asking the question, how free is my will? Now the answer to that question is rooted in your theology of sin. Sin has either impacted or affected your will or it's not impacted or affected your will. There was a guy in church history named Pelagius and Pelagius came around and said, sin has no effect on our wills. In fact, we are all in the same state that Adam and Eve were prior to the fall. But the Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned, their sin infected the whole human race. That's called the doctrine of original sin. Are you with me? Okay. So Arminians, Jacob Arminius, led by his people that followed him, which were called the Remonstrants in the 1600s, they came along and said, yeah, we're totally depraved. We believe in the doctrine of original sin. We don't believe what Pelagius taught. We believe in the doctrine of original sin. And when Jesus came and died upon the cross, he then restored humanity to where they were prior to the fall in Genesis 3. And at that time, the death of Christ gave us a provenient grace that now enables every person in the world to choose Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a provenient grace. The idea is that every person, because of the death of Christ, now has the ability to exercise faith because of what Jesus did upon the cross. Does that make sense? Now the question is, is that in the Bible? What does the Bible say? Now, when we talk about the Arminian view of provenient grace, there's technically two main views of this. One is universal, which means now everyone can believe. So Jesus died, and now everyone in the world can believe. There's another uh, form of this, which is called individual provenient grace. If you're not confused already, that's okay. Go back and listen to the tape. Which means that when someone hears the gospel, rightly preached, at that moment, they're given a provenient grace to believe. Does that make sense? Okay, now this is very important. Roman Catholics mean that you have the ability in yourself, it's almost like Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, you have the ability into yourself, and so when you go and put your faith in Christ, God just gives you a little boost, he assists you. Arminians teach that no, God doesn't give us a boost, we are depraved, but Jesus' death didn't actually save us. Jesus' death now makes it possible. Jesus' death just gave us the ability to exercise faith. He provided us with the ability to exercise faith. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, the Calvinistic view or the Reformed view. This is one of the main things that separates the Reformers from Roman Catholicism during the time of the Reformation. When Calvinists say they believe in provenient grace or people that hold to the Reformed tradition, and this is what the Bible teaches, is that, mark this down, regeneration precedes faith. Regeneration precedes faith. Because of my sin, because of my total depravity, I don't have the ability within myself to exercise faith in Christ. So I need God to provide me with faith so that I can exercise faith in Christ. But the question is, when and how does God provide that? Roman Catholics, he assists. Armenianism, at the cross, everybody has the ability now. Calvinists, or Reformed people, say no, we're still totally depraved. And so the only way I can exercise faith in Christ is if I am first born again. This is called in theological circles the order salutis in Latin, the order of salvation. The Bible talks a lot, of, a lot of words are used to describe our salvation. And we take those words and we try to figure out the logical order of them. So in order, if the Bible tells me, and we just read one instance where the Apostle Peter says, my faith is given like a, through a casting of lots. If that's how my faith is given, the question is, is, well, if I didn't earn my ability to choose God, how do I actually get it? The biblical answer is you're born again. God gives you spiritual life and the result of that spiritual life is you exercise faith in Christ. Now let's look at a couple verses to maybe clear up the confusion that I've completely created in your minds, all right? Turn with me to 1 John 5, 1. 1 John 5, 1. You're like, wow, we're gonna be in 2 Peter for 10 years. 1 John 5, 1. In 1 John 5, 1, we read, 
Now, go slow with me here, okay? Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So here's the question, what comes first? Ganeo is the Greek word, born of God, begotten, regenerate, spiritually born. Now, let me just back up. If you're new this morning and all this theology stuff's going over your head, keep coming back. We'll unpack this as the weeks and months come. But if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to know that you were born into this world spiritually dead. The Bible says that because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we've inherited their corruption and we've inherited the punishment for their sin. God doesn't give perfect babies to imperfect parents. Our parents were sinners and their parents were sinners and their parents were sinners. We all, according to David in Psalm 51, we are conceived in iniquity. We're born into this world spiritually dead. So God, in his mercy and his grace, when he saves a person, he grants to us spiritual life. He awakens us to the reality of our sinfulness. He awakens us to the goodness of Christ. And he provides for us the faith that we need to respond to Christ. Notice 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now the phrase born of God is in the perfect tense in Greek. Now it's harder to see in English, but in Greek, perfect tense means that being born predates the human action of believing. Grammatically speaking, it's impossible to believe that before being born of God. Because you're born of God, you're able to believe. Turn to Philippians chapter one. Turn to Philippians chapter one. Just so you know, this isn't an isolated thing in the Bible. I wanna take you through a little Bible study. Philippians chapter one, look at verse 29. Philippians 1, verse 29. For to you, it has been granted. Notice the word granted, circle, underline that in your Bible. It has been granted for Christ's sake, not merely to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. According to this verse, two things have been granted to you. The ability to believe and suffering. And suffering. God has granted belief. Turn back to John chapter one. In John chapter one, our Lord, or rather John tells us, in John chapter one, verse 12, but as many as received him, that is Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of what? You were born not by your own will. Now, here's why this supports the Calvinistic view. If you're an Arminian, or if you're a Roman Catholic, this is what you believe. Faith... I exercise, and after I exercise faith, I become born again. Does that make sense? So I exercise faith, then I'm born again. The reform view is I'm born again, then I exercise faith. It's the opposite way. Does that make sense? Notice the text. Verse 13 says, we are not born of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but we are born, what? Of God. So regeneration has to come first because it has absolutely nothing to do with us. Do we actually exercise faith in Christ? We do, we absolutely do. But that ability is not natural to us, it's given to us through regeneration. Regeneration precedes faith. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, we read, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice Jesus is the author and the perfecter of what? Okay, everybody, who's the author of your faith? I hope nobody said me. (laughs) Jesus is the author of your faith, and he's the completer of it. He will bring it to completion. He's the finisher. He's the author and completion, completer of our faith. Turn to... 1 Corinthians 12. And my point is to exhaust you a little bit into saying uncle. At least I'm honest and I show you my cards, right? 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He gives us spiritual life. Read John chapter three. That's the whole conversation with Nicodemus. You must be born of the Spirit. No one can say that Jesus is Lord. You can't believe that Jesus is the Lord unless you're born of the Spirit, unless by the Holy Spirit. Now, why does regeneration have to take place before we can exercise faith? The answer is, is because who we are before God saves us. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, 26, that before we come to Christ, we have a heart of stone. And when we come to Christ, that heart of stone is removed and he puts a new spirit within us and gives us a heart of flesh. Turn to Ephesians chapter two. In Ephesians chapter two, beginning in verse one, or rather we'll just cover verse one, real straight to the point, don't miss this. And you were dead in your trespasses and what? Do you know how hard it is to preach to an unbelieving crowd? Do you wanna know what that's like? By the way, I've done that on a couple of occasions. You know what that's like? All you have to do is go drive to a graveyard and stand in front of a bunch of graves and command the people that are in those graves to come back to life. Why can you not exercise faith before you're regenerate? Because you're dead. And what do dead people do? Nothing. Before you became a Christian, you were spiritually dead. You did not possess the life of God in you. And as a result, you wanted absolutely nothing to do with God. Turn to Romans chapter three. In Romans chapter three, Paul gives his dissertation on total depravity. Look at verse nine. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Who on this earth is righteous apart from Christ? Not one. There is none who understands. Who apart from Christ understands doctrine? No one. There is none who seeks for God. Who seeks God apart from Christ? No one. There's no such thing as a seeker. If you have not come to Christ, the only reason you have not come to Christ is because you are dominated by your lust. You don't want Christ. You want something he can give you. But if you want him because of who he is, it's because he first does a work in you And because he has worked in you, that's why you have responded to him. He goes on. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave, and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the paths of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Listen. 
The reason why regeneration has to precede faith is because you are totally dead in your trespasses and sins and the life of God is not in you. So what do you do? Well, you don't pray a prayer and you don't walk forward at an altar and give your life to Christ. What you do is wherever you're at, you beat your heart and you say, Lord, have mercy on me. Do something in me and to me that I am not able to do myself. You must be born again or you will never see the kingdom of God. You must be born again or you will never enter the kingdom of God. Something has to be done to you from outside of you and that is to give you new life. And as you possess new life, spiritual life, eternal life, that then results in you exercising faith in God. It was a faith that you received, not that you had. Turn back to 2 Peter. Well, I'm delighted to report that we got through point one. We're gonna come back next week. And we've noted, notice verse one, to those who have received a faith. We noted that faith is received. Next week, we'll note that we have the same faith as Peter. There's no second class Christians. Not only that, we'll notice that the object of our faith is Christ. And thirdly, we'll note that the ornaments or ornaments of our faith are grace and peace. Christian, this morning, you need to remember and be so thankful that the faith that you have is a faith that you have received. And if you are among us and you don't have faith, acknowledge your sin to God. Ask him for mercy. Cry out to him to give you spiritual life that results in faith. We'll close with one verse. Romans chapter one, verse 17. This is the verse that ultimately God used to convert the great reformer, Martin Luther. I remember when I first read this verse, or rather learned, when God opened my eyes to what this verse meant, it changed so many things about the way I live my Christian life. When I read the account of Martin Luther reading this verse and then describing how the spiritual life of God broke forth upon his soul like light light breaking the dawn or the, the, the night sky, Notice what this says, verse 17. For in it, that is the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. But it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Here's a question. This is what Luther realized. Luther thought that I exercise faith and then I'll become righteous. But notice what the verse says, particularly the Old Testament quote. But the righteous shall live by faith. What comes first? Being righteous or living by faith? Being righteous. You don't live by faith and as a result you become righteous. God makes you righteous and the result is that you exercise faith. If you think about your Christian life as trying so hard to be faithful and that's gonna equal righteousness, you're on a legalistic treadmill that's gonna burn you out. But if you rejoice that God has already made you righteous and that the faith that you exercise 
is a direct result of that righteousness, then when you see yourself exercising faith, it will just cause you to be so thankful for the righteousness that you already have. We don't work to make ourselves righteous. God makes us righteous, and then we live by faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder, the reminder that even the faith that we have is a faith that we received. All is of grace. We love you, Lord. And this Thanksgiving, post-Thanksgiving Eve, we are thankful that you have given us a faith that we did not have in ourselves before you graciously gave it to us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for giving us a faith that's the same as every brother and sister that lives now and it has lived before us. We have the same faith because it was not a faith that drummed up within us individually. It was a faith that you gave us from yourself and the result is it's all the same. Lord, we confess that we are now one in Christ because you have given us life and given us the faith that we exercise. Lord, how encouraging it is when we're so prone to think that maybe one day we'll stop exercising faith. How encouraging it is to know that the faith that we have is here because it's a faith that we have received. Oh Lord, our blessed God, who keeps us forever and ever. Thank you for your staying power. Thank you for keeping us near when we are so prone to wonder. We love you. And we cry, never let us go. Never let us go. Never let us go. In Jesus' name, amen.